why don't we give Jesus a big shout? Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! Oh, come on! I like, I like the very concluding part of that song. It says, it's what you say. Aren't you happy it's what he says? Remember that time that you were afraid and you said you were dead? Thank God it's not what you say. Because otherwise you wouldn't be here. And remember every one of those times that you say, I've just had enough, I am tired. Thank God it's what he says and not what you say. Is what he says. Alrighty, why don't we just um, sit down in God's presence. And I just want to read this verse of scripture. And just read this and I believe that it's going to bless everybody. In the mighty name of Jesus. Jesus was speaking in Matthew chapter 12 verse 11. I want to share with you something that just hit me of late. And it says, actually let's just read a little bit from verse 10. And the Bible says, behold, the end, behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him saying, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? That they may accuse him. Now, don't you just wish God revealed to you what people may be thinking about when they say stuff to you? Because then you will stop responding to everything that is being said. Because some people ask you a question not because they want to know. But the Bible says they asked him so that they may accuse him. And then Jesus answered and said to them, what man is there among you who has one sheep and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath will not lay hold of it and lift it out oh how much of how much more value than is a man than a sheep therefore it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath Now look at the way Jesus operated. He knew they were asking him so that they can accuse him. But his response disarmed them. The way that he approached the question, I mean, he showed them who they were and where they were at. And that was the end of the argument. You see, quite often, and I've been sharing with us lately that When people are blinded, they don't even see their own situation. That is when they think somehow that there is a speck in your own eye. And the way to stop people from being cynical and being overly dramatic is for you to pray for their eyes to be open. So that they can leave you alone. And so what did Jesus say? Jesus knew that they were asking so that they can accuse him. And what did he say? He says, now let's make this thing very clear. This is what y'all do. And because Jesus knew them, that they were not as righteous as they were making out to be, he hit them at that very sensitive spot and they could respond no further. One of the things that I want us to draw from this, we had a leaders meeting about a week, it was was like two weeks ago. And I shared with the folks on the call and I said, look, We have been in situations wherein we've been taken advantage of. But we cannot always be there. Because God expects that we're not always just operating by the mercy of God that protects us and shields us. God God expects for us to mature and go beyond the level of certain battles. If you're still battling with the things that you battled with 20 years ago. Like my wife would say, that means you are not growing as you should. Because no one's going to come now and present me with elementary school math. Because I passed that test when I was there. But then if I'm still here and they're presenting me with quadratic equations from middle school, then there's an issue. I mean, I should not forget the lessons that I learned. I should be applying them now, but I should not be made subject to tests just to show if I know them or if I would stand. You see what I mean? And so here is the deal. If we have been through certain things, how is it that we make sure that we can demonstrate that we have mastered that level and we're ready to move to the next? By being able to spot those things before they get too close. By discernment, we wage war. What is discernment? Discernment is essentially when you are operating in wisdom. 
Can I prove that to you? When Jesus was working miracles, people did not come and say, wow, by what power is he doing these things? They said, by what wisdom? And do you know the reason why they asked by what wisdom he was doing those things? Because the miracles were always championed in discernment. He would discern what is really going on. Sometimes they thought it was a physical condition. He would tell them, no, it's a demonic oppression. Sometimes they thought it was by guilt or condemnation, but he would tell them, no, it is for the glory of God. Remember when they came to him and said, oh, this man was born blind. One of his parents or both of them must have been sinners. But by discernment, he knew that it was because of the glory of God. So when you see wisdom in operation, it looks like discernment. And that is what Jesus was demonstrating and exemplifying for us here. That we must also operate in the same spirit of discernment. Because if we don't know what time we're in, then guess what? We're going to be shooting at an enemy that hasn't arrived or one that has long gone. And we will try to harvest grapes that are not ripe or the ones that are already rotten. Simply because every time we step out, we need to step out with divine precision. The Bible says that the race is not of the swift, the battle is not of the strong, but time and chance happens to them all. So today I want to talk about a particular kind of discernment. I brought this up because I would like for us to see that Jesus operated by discernment, but there are many kinds of discernment operation. We operate in discernment sometimes. Okay, let me give you four examples from Jesus' life. Example number one was he knew what they were trying to do to him. Sometimes he would discern what they are trying to do for themselves. At times when they wanted to say certain things just so that they can look good, Jesus also knew. He says, I can tell you all are here with your long garments so that you can be recognized by me because they knew Jesus was getting such a following from people. They knew Jesus was getting accepted by people and they just wanted Jesus to endorse them. They want Jesus to give them the blue tick. So that they don't have to repent from their dead works because Jesus already endorsed that when you're a Pharisee, you'll be number one in the kingdom, at least number two. You understand what I mean? Because these people were not at, they were at war with the devil, but they didn't care about the war with the devil because to fight the devil, you have to be in the spirit. But these guys wanted to be in the flesh and so they were fighting other people. So the Pharisees and the Sadducees were on different occasions coming, trying to use Jesus' integrity and approval rating with the people for their own election. They came to Jesus on several occasions. The Pharisees trying to use Jesus' teaching and approval to condemn the Sadducees. And the Sadducees will also try to do the same thing. And so Jesus knew. So you discern what people want to do to you, what they want you to do for them. And there are times when you just have to discern what is going on in the realm of the spirit at that particular point in time. You have to be able to discern what is going on in the spirit at that particular point in time. You see, because there are times we're in. You see when Jesus told his disciples, he says, I must work the work of him who has sent me while it is day for the night is coming when no man can walk. Jesus recognized by discernment the time that he was in. Because it was lawful for him because he is the Lord of all things to take a vacation at that particular point in time. Because many of us, we make the right moves at the wrong time. It is perhaps my biggest sin, according to my wife. She's always saying, right thing at the wrong time. And I'm like, but this thing has to be done. And she says, but not now. Every one of us is waiting for you in the car. And here you are trying to fix the window. You see what I mean? You see, and many of us are like that. Right thing, wrong time. Jesus says there's a time to chill. He says, but not now. So you have to be able to discern timing. Timing is very critical. And that's one of the things that I want us to talk about today. Understanding the times that we are in. Because the moment you understand the time that you are in, guess what? The burden becomes lighter on you. On certain days, my wife gives me seven things that I must do before I can come upstairs. Right? And that happens because I may have spent all my time doing only all my things and none of anybody else's thing in the house. And they're like, she's like, you live here too. So you must do what you must do. I'm like, I've been on the call. I've had business meetings. She's like, yeah, well done to you, as you should. <laughs> but you still need to do what you must do. 
You understand what I mean? And so, if I look at all of what I need to do, I get overwhelmed sometimes. And I start praying. For God to make her forget. I start praying for God to send help. You see what I mean? And God is like, I already did. The help you need is someone that can help you do what you must do. You see what I mean? But the moment you break down all of what you need to do by time, then suddenly you're not overwhelmed because you don't have to do all of it at the same time. You understand what I mean? And so timing is very critical. In fact, I think I'm going to take this approach. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 7. And I'm going to show you a couple of things that helps us to appreciate the appropriation of time. And then once we see there's a little, not even a little, there's a powerful weapon here. Uh, in Proverbs chapter 7. And we're just going to read from verse 4. And look at what it says. Proverbs chapter 7 verse 4. He says, say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding my nearest kin. That they may keep me from the moral woman and from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, he says what? He says that they may keep me from the moral woman and from the seductress who flatters with her words. Now, someone is like, How does this, what does this have to do with time management and time keeping? Let me tell you something. There are several things that are always trying to get your attention. And they will be appealing to you. And they will try to seduce you from your way to that particular thing. But if you don't think about it in this particular perspective, you know, many people don't have a problem with recognizing where the seductress is and going the other way. But they are obeying calls that other people have over their lives rather than the call that God has placed over their life because they think, oh, it's nothing. I just want to help out a little bit. The Bible says, if you don't operate by wisdom and by understanding, you will get easily seduced and distracted to follow after idols and things and people that will do you no good. How can you avoid distraction? It is not by determination or commitment. The Bible says it is by wisdom and understanding. Now, let's, let's look at one more thing. Verse 11 of the same Roman, I mean, Proverbs chapter 7. Verse 11 says, she was loud and rebellious and her, fool, uh, her feet would not stay at home. One of the ways by which you know what you are not supposed to be doing at that time is an unholy restlessness begins to happen on the inside of you. I have come to understand that when I'm feeling uneasy or restless about a thing, that is not the time for me to do it. It doesn't matter how loud that, that thing is. It could be shouting and say, oh, you, you haven't gone out to Kroger to witness in a while. You see, because sometimes the devil will come and present something that seems righteous so that you can, it makes the guilt even more severe. He makes the guilt even more intense because he knows how committed you are to going out there to witnessing. And God is saying, no, not today. That's not the time. The time that we're in right now is a time for you to pray for those people that you've been praying for for a week that you still haven't heard from. You know, because there are times when you think, oh, I'll pray for these people. But the Lord is saying, you need to pray until you receive that which you petition of the Lord. And so no matter how loudly the enemy is screaming or how loudly my passions are screaming, because let's put it this way, we blame the devil for everything, but there are times wherein it is you and your uncontrolled emotions. It is you and your unchecked passions. It is you and some promises that you made to yourself. Oh, that by the time I'm 40, I would have a skyscraper in the middle of New York. And you put all that on yourself, even when God is telling you to let go of the things of this world, you're like, no, I have to keep running because I'm not there yet. And some of those things become so loud because of how much energy you have given to those voices within you. Loud and guess what? Most times when it is loud, it is rebellious. What is rebellion to be against the will of God? The way the devil gets us is the devil looks attractive. The devil looks seductive. And some of these things that are supposed to take us away from the path of righteousness, they don't look like bad things. The devil is not going to come to you and say, Kev, Kev, start spinning on your head in the middle of town. Immediately you say, get thee behind me, O Satan. Because that's not a good thing to do. You understand what I mean? But then he can say something to you like, the way that guy spoke to you, you should not accept that. You're a man of God. You're born again, you're anointed. Don't let nobody talk to you like that. And then you're like, <laughs> come back here. <laughs> Who do you think? Now you're fighting a battle that you think is a right battle. You understand? When the Lord says, it is not your battle, it is mine. You just leave them. 
You see, when they try to belittle you, let God surprise them. Because when the enemy is trying to belittle you, they are doing themselves a disadvantage because when they think they have succeeded in belittling you, then God elevates you and they are so shocked and so surprised that many of them don't recover from it. You understand what I'm saying? And so just let them do them and then you do you. You understand what I mean? And so the devil will come with all kinds of things that appear to be good, but in fact, they are not good. If you so, so let me give an example to men. Men can relate with this example. If you have a particular type, okay? So let's use you as an example, right? Because you're not married, so no woman's going to get angry at me, hopefully. <laughs> so if your type is that they have to be only four feet tall. No, no, because... Yeah, yeah. I mean, some people have a taste like that. I'm just trying to be realistic here. And so the lady has to be like four foot nothing, if that is your type, right? And she needs to be no, I mean, I would say no heavier than 60 pounds. Literally, someone that can be blown by the wind. You see, it makes it easy. You don't have to do anything. The wind sweeps her for you, off her feet. Now, the devil's been watching you because the devil sees what you watch. You understand what I mean? The devil is like every time he's scrolling. I'm not talking about you this time around. But he gets to a lady that is four foot nothing and weighs 60 pounds. The fingers slow down. It takes a minute to look. Every time he's at Publix and he sees somebody that looks like that, he stops to look. And when he gets home, he says, Lord, if you would just give me this woman, I will go to India and do your work. This is all I'm asking. So the devil knows. Now, do you think the devil is going to tempt you with someone that is about 180 pounds and six feet, two inches? No. Simply because you may not even recognize them as a woman. You may just think of them as a giant from Jericho. You will pay no attention. It's like, I don't know, this is, is this really a woman? This is what the devil does. And the reason why I'm using men as examples is because in the natural, men are driven a lot by what they see to be appealing to them. But in the spirit, every single one of us is like that. The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man but the end of it is destruction and that is the reason why you need wisdom and understanding to avoid the seductress to avoid the rebellious and the loud otherwise things that have no business engaging you I mean things you have no business engaging with and getting occupied with will take the most of what you're supposed to be doing and when the day of reckoning comes you're like God you expect you thought I should do that oh I didn't know but God, I thought what I was doing was important. And God is like, no, it looked important to you. Remember those people, those evangelists who came to Jesus and said, we did miracles in your name. We organized crusades. Several people were slain in the spirit. <laughs> Say that again. <laughs> oh, it was magic dust. Yeah, yeah, the gold dust and the feathers and all of that stuff. We did miracles in your name. They didn't even say we did miracles by sorcery in your name. We did it in your name. And Jesus was like, what, what else did you do? They were like, that was it? And he says, well, that wasn't what I was expecting you to do. You did too much. You know, like I always say, most of us, the reason why we're not doing enough is because we're doing the most. Oh, yeah. You, you can tweet that. The reason why we're not doing enough is because we are doing the most. You are doing the most. I was telling my wife today, even though she was laughing at me when I was doing it. You see? Pay attention to the help that God has given to you. That sister, that brother that speaks the word of God to you over and over again. And you know they're always right. You see, I wish I had listened to my wife and not posted the video because no one's watching it. <laughs> but the message of the video was for me, but I thought I shared it with the world. And my wife was laughing when she heard me. I was walking around like, oh, and it didn't work. I should have just listened. But the message of it is a good message. And what is the message? It's up at the wrong time. Thank you, baby. When you look at the seasons of the year, what do you and I do to put leaves back on the trees when spring comes? Nothing. God has already set it into motion and it just comes. Right? But because the system of the world wants to enslave our minds, the world is always telling you nothing happens if you don't do it. And that is the reason why we're constantly in this gear mindset of always thinking we have to do it. Because there is no master really in the worldly sense of things 
who wants to come to his yard and his slaves are sitting down playing video game. It's like, I bought these people. I'm paying for their time. They're eating my food. They must be doing something. You know how it is at work wearing? Some, I saw a video recently. Someone says, this is what I do at work to look like I'm doing something. I just walk very fast. <laughs> Everywhere you go, just walk very fast. Look busy. You go to a file that has nothing in it. And you'll be flipping through imaginary pages and doing that. How many of us have done that before? And it works. You see that your computer and you're typing absolutely nothing. You're daydreaming and the moment somebody walks by your cubicle, you start looking at that screen like you're trying to balance the account. You look very serious. I mean, I used to do that as a consultant. Sometimes I would go to places and within a couple of hours, I've figured out what their problem is. I'm like, this is these people's problem. But this contract is a two-week contract. And I'm not just going to, you know, kick myself out of work. I don't want to disappoint them. They want to spend this money. I am here to help. All righty. And so the rest of the, of the week, I'm there on the whiteboard, writing stuff and pondering. <laughs> Half the time, I'm daydreaming. I will write the same thing, and when I come back the next day, because the board is not properly wiped, I just trace the same triangles that I drew yesterday. <laughs> drew the same table in a different color this time around, and look very serious. We do things like that because people have an expectation for us to be doing something. But God has an expectation for you to do only that which you should per time. So what did we read in Matthew chapter 12 verse 11? Because Jesus knew what they were thinking and he wanted to equip you and I with the right kind of discernment. It particularly, he used the Sabbath example. Sabbath is the day that the Lord rested. You understand what I mean? And so if you are not doing what you're supposed to do, guess what? When the time comes for you to rest, you may not be able to rest because you still are in that mindset of, oh, I must do, I must do, I must do. And that is what the world expects of us. But the moment you understand the time that you're in, then you do that which is enough for you to do. In fact, before we go ahead, I want to show us something about the times that we are in so that we're not busy getting distracted because the distraction is abundant anywhere you turn you know why we're yet to recover from the slap that will give chris right a lot of other craziness has been going on in the world everyone is like some people are rejoicing that elon musk has now bought twitter and they're like oh finally we can share the truth without anybody censoring it okay Okay. Did Jesus say you shall speak the truth only on Twitter? <laughs> you understand what I mean? You see, we always look for excuses and we're always trying to justify all the busyness that God did not ask us to do. Some people are losing their minds now because they're like, wow, finally, the political landscape is going to be what we want it to be. Jesus did not call you to that. What he called you to, you have not done it. Your neighbor does not know Jesus. And that has nothing to do with the Twitter bird. You understand what I mean? And let me tell you something. In a way... I say in a way because some part of it we need to pay attention to. But in a way, it's mostly just a distraction. I have learned one thing. The moment the majority is paying attention to something, I only pay little attention to it. Simply because the ones that are herding the cattle lead the majority astray. You see what I mean? And when in this world has God ever been in the majority? When Jesus told his disciples the strategy for the church, what did he say? He asked them a question. He says, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? What is the consensus of opinion? What are people saying? Oh, some say you're a prophet. Some say you're a teacher. Now, those things they stated were facts. Because the Bible says he will, in fact, be a prophet as unto Moses. And many have called him teacher and he did not rebuke them because in fact he did teach them and he was moving in the power of the Holy Spirit who is the teacher. But because of the fact that he was coming as public opinion, Jesus dissociated himself from it. 
He says, who do men say that I the son of man am? And they say, you're this, you're Elias that is to come and blah, blah, blah. And then he said, okay, but who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke and says, you are Christ, son of the living God. And Jesus says, now, you are Peter. You see, because if you do not know what God is saying, you will not know who you are. As long as you're listening to what the world is saying, you would only know who the world wants you to be, yet another sheep in the fold of the enemy. But the moment Peter recognized what the Lord was saying, he was able to receive the revelation of who he was. That is the number one reward that we get from paying attention to what God is saying. It allows us to know better who we are and what we are supposed to be doing. Jesus says, you are Peter. And upon this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Upon the rock of personal revelation as opposed to consensus of opinion. Because if we're only following the consensus of opinion, what everybody else is saying, I guarantee you one thing, we will end up where everybody else ends up. And the Bible says, broad is the road that leads to destruction, but narrow is the way that leads to life and peace. So we need to know what time it is. So I want to show you a picture here. And I'm on, I'll give you a little background to the story. Um, a while ago, Alan came to me and he was passionate about certain things and he was asking questions about setting other things and the Lord said to him teach him how to appropriate all of these many things otherwise we can be so occupied with many good ideas without necessarily understanding the God idea for where we're at and so I said to him I said Alan I said, in the times that we're in, there's a lot going on in the world. We cannot decipher every signal, but we have to pay attention to the ones made for us. And where are we supposed to find the signs that are made for us? Jesus says, when you see these things, okay, all of these things will happen for the children of disobedience, but you will see them. Now, when you see them, you look up because up is where your own instructions are clearly detailed. Now, I know what the world has done to us. The world has given us such, uh, they've, they've, they've steered, us away, steered us away from things that are helpful to us. They try to hide scriptures from us. They try to, um, what's the word, demonize things that are good for us. Things, things like astronomy. You see, and people don't want to look at the stars because of the soothsayers. Because of all those people who are living their lives by the zodiac, right? And so, because those things have been demonized, we don't want to touch them. But I always ask people, what does God say about those things? He says, behold, I have put in the firmament of the heavens, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And what are they for? They are for signs and they are for seasons. God commanded the children of Issachar, one of the tribes of Israel, because they understood the signs of the times. The sons of Issachar were literally astronomers. They knew how to read the stars. One of the wisest people that we know, whose writings span across about 6,000 centuries of relevance, is a man by the name of Job. Job was one man who wrote about animals that have gone into extinction. He wrote about technology that we will not discover until the 20th century. He wrote about the end of all technology as we we're about to see it. And this man said that himself was instructed by God on how to understand the message of the Pleiades. He knew how to read the stars. But then because the devil knew that if the church continued to be equipped in being able to look at the blood moons and know what they are, look at the sun and the moon and their positioning. In fact, when they asked Jesus, how would we know of your second coming? How would we know of your return? He says, well, in the day, that great day of the Lord, he says the sun will go black and the moon will be red. He was still talking about the things that will happen in the heavens. But how many of us today even bother to look up? There's a movie on Netflix that says, don't look up. And that is the reason why you should look up because what they tell you, just do the opposite. You understand what I mean? So they said, don't look up, but definitely, please look up. If I lay on your back, fall asleep and wake up and still be looking up so that you do not miss a thing. And Alan took that counsel on 
with all zest and he's been looking up and so he found this and he sent this to me when I looked at it I closed it very quickly because I was exploding when I saw it and I'm like no 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 no. I'm gonna just wait until I talk to him first because if I continue with this explosion I may not even be able to tell what I am seeing because let me tell you something the Holy Spirit as soon as I opened it he just started to show to me what I was looking at it is one thing for you to look up but it is another thing for you to see what the Lord is showing you and so when he showed me this and this is something that is about to happen on the 16th of May and for the people that will watch it online let's make sure that we put the screenshot in the video so that so that they, when, they, when, they, when they're looking at it they know what they're seeing now on the 16th of May right I like numbers God he is the one that invented numbers and he speaks to us through numbers in fact the whole book in the bible is called numbers right oh yeah everything is everything happens for us you know uh, there's everything ha- is numerical now let me tell you how it works because one day i asked god i'm like okay can't things just happen randomly must everything have a number associated with it and god says yes he said because if i'm not intentional nothing happens the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God and by him all things were made and there was nothing made that was made without him so if Jesus is the author and the finisher of all things then you know that nothing happens by accident why because he is not just the spoken word of God we're also talking about the written word of God God writes everything down And because he writes everything down, God weighs everything that he's about to write down to make sure that it has substance that is rooted in his word and his wisdom. And that is the reason why nothing happens. There is a number that is associated with everything. Why? Because number is numbers is the system for God's measurement. God measures things by numbers. The Bible says that he looked at men and he looked at the number of their days and he weighed it against the evil of their hearts and it was like there is an imbalance. They're living too long so we need to shorten their lives otherwise this evil will be too much. The Bible did not say God looked at their evil. No, he first of all looked at the number of their days. You understand man? 900 years and their hearts are evil continually. It's not working for them. Neither is it working for heaven. So basically, let's cut it down to about 120 and we'll come back and check and see how they're doing. And after a while, he came back and it was like, they're still being evil. We're like, okay, maybe we'll reduce it to like 75. You understand what I mean? And since then, it's kind of like being like that. Because if they reduce it any further, then we might have an excuse to say, well, God, I didn't have enough time to do what you asked me to do. But you know what? Let me tell you something interesting about that. Some of you have heard me say this before. One one day, myself and the Holy Spirit were conversing. And he said to me, he said... um, do you know the reason why we cut down the age and how that works I said well I have a question and my question is how fair is it for me who's going to live maybe like 120 years to be judged the same way as the guys who lived 960 years I mean they had more time and he said this to me he says none of what the father has written concerning them and concerning you will go unfulfilled even if you lived for a day or a thousand years because before the father a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day he said not only did we shorten the time of their being here we sped up the things that they are able to accomplish in the time people lived for 900 and something years it probably takes them six months to mold one brick because they don't have the tools that you and i have it probably takes them three years to go to marietta it probably takes them three years to go. Let me tell you something. My mom was in, my mom was in Egypt one day. You know, we were like, hey, mom, where, where are you? She says, well, we're having breakfast in Egypt. And by lunchtime, right, they were in Jerusalem. They were in the promised land from Egypt within a couple of hours. Whereas it took those guys 40 years. I mean, forget about the disobedience and the hardness of their hearts. Even if they were walking in a straight line and singing praises and obedient to God, it still would have taken them about 11 years. But now we have the technology. So we don't have an excuse. You can't stay here and say, well, Methuselah had 960 years. So please take it easy with me, God. I have only 96. Only like a tenth of what they had. And the Lord is saying, you know, everything still happens 
because the Bible says you will be without excuse. You understand what I mean? And guess what? A lot of what they learned, we do not have to relearn. How many people here had to learn how to make fire? No, you just buy the matchbox. Or better still, the lighter. And some people now have an app on their phone when they want to cook. They just push the button and then the light will come up on their stove. Okay, don't be safe enough to buy it. That is excessive convenience in my opinion. But now, we're back here. You look at the number here. The first thing that jumped to me was that number 2 of 12, which is the number 33. Okay? So at 12, 12 a.m., this is going to be the formation in the heavens. The number 12, 12 is the number 33, which was how long Jesus lived for while he was on earth because his mission was to give us authority that we lost because the number 33 represents the order of the earth relative to the order of heaven. People say, as above, so below. The Bible says there are three that bear witness in heaven and three that bear witness on the earth, even though the two on the earth sometimes bear witness as one. You understand what I mean? And so when you see that number 33, and that is the reason why that number 33 is always reoccurring, the occults want to use it all the time because it's a symbol of authority. And that is not authority on the earth alone, but a symbol of heavenly authority. Many people use those two numbers as a way of opening portals of energy from dimension to dimension simply because it is a number that brings alignment. When heaven aligns with the earth, then you can make things happen. Things don't happen when the earth is functioning on its own. Things happen when there is an alignment Okay, and so one of the things that we've been studying very closely, myself and Alan lately, is we've been studying the alignment of the Jewish calendar, which is still the closest we know to the calendar of heaven and the Gregorian calendar that we're using. And one of the things that's been apparent lately is that what, what are we down to now? One or two days? One day. One day, it's so close. But by the time you look at what is in here, look at that time, 12-12, we're going to see this alignment in the heavens. Now, I, I, I really don't like to bother people with all of these things anymore because people keep telling me oh, oh, oh. someone said to me I've been born again for a long time but even I still don't understand your messages and I'm like okay I've been hearing that since forever people tell me dumb me down dumb me down but we need these things because why would God spend his time arranging the stars because he wants to send you a message but you're too busy looking at the message that Rhonda sent you Many of us are too busy looking at the messages that men have sent us. Why was the SMS invented? So that we can be fully distracted and not hear what God is saying. If you pay as much attention to what God is saying as to what comments people are making on social media, let me tell you something, you will be on fire. People will think Elijah is back from heaven. The distraction is just too much. But we need to know these things because the Bible says we have the mind of Christ. And Christ created these things. And so I should be able to understand them by just looking at them. I don't have to go back to school to study astronomy or astrology. I can just look based on what the word of God says. I didn't have a degree in astrology, even though I'm quite nosy. So I've read things, I've looked into things. But let me tell you something. There isn't really anything that I have looked into in the natural that you do not have access to. The YouTube at my house is not different from yours. <laughs> Unless, of course, you're using Comcast and the internet is rubbish. But that's a story for another day. Show off. Okay, so look at what we have going on here. Look at that constellation. That constellation is called Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus is standing over Scorpius. And Scorpius is holding Libra. When I saw that, like I told you, it was almost like someone set up a, a bomb. The explosion was like boom. Because in a moment, I saw what the Lord was showing me. When I was trying to explain it uh, to legend... That's a legend. He can be a legend sometimes. Uh, to Alan, I said, let us look at the legend of Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus, the legend of Ophiuchus stipulates that there was a time in ancient times that a king lost his son. The son of a king died. And when the son of the king died, Ophiuchus appeared. And by using herbs, Ophiuchus was able to raise the son from the dead. <laughs> Who raised Jesus from the dead? The Holy Spirit. Right? 
The Bible says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Jesus from the dead will quicken your mortal body by your Holy Spirit. Now, what is the fulfillment of prom- what promise was being fulfilled when the Holy Spirit came? A promise that God made in prophecy through the ministry of David. When David says, he will not allow his Holy One to seek corruption, neither will he abandon my soul in Hades. It is a message to the church as it was to the Lord Jesus. Because the Lord is not going to allow for us to remain in the state where we're in, when we're constantly being oppressed, in the state that we're in, when it seems like the enemy is winning, in the state that we're in, wherein we've lost our brothers and sisters to the deception of the world. But the Bible says God is not going to allow our souls to remain in Hades. He sent us to Hades so that we can use the key that he has given to us to possess the gates of our enemies and spoil them by taking all of what they've stolen from us. But it's not going to allow you because the Holy Spirit spirit is your getaway vehicle you take the goodies then he gets you out of there Ophiuchus raised the sun but that is not the only thing that the Lord showed me what do you see here you see serpents cauda or coda which is the serpent you see serpents from the word serpent you see what he's holding is holding a serpent but it's not holding the serpent by the neck it's just holding it by the body anybody can hold a serpent by the neck because the moment you grab a serpent by the neck it's not going to bite you but when you hold it by its body and it still doesn't bite you you are sending a message that i have authority over you you understand what i mean now a fear cause is demonstrating to us one of the things that the Lord demonstrated to Moses to give Moses the confidence that he was with him. He told him to cast down his rod. And when Moses cast down the rod, the rod became a serpent. And when he picked it up, the Lord said, no, don't grab it by the head. Anybody can do that. I want you to know that I've given you authority. Just grab it anywhere. And he grabbed it by the tail and the serpent could not bite it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Philippians. Praise the Lord. This is Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 that says, be careful for nothing. We have been working, we have been walking on eggshells because the system says you have to do this. The system says you have to do that. And we're not able to do the will of our father. But right now, I am no longer careful to speak to you, O King Agrippa. You know, there's a time when we were careful not to offend anybody. But right now, we will grab the serpent however we like and we shall not be beaten. Because... Praise the Lord. The time that we're in, we do not have time to be studying the neck of the serpent. The time that we're in is is go time. We just grab and we go. Maybe that's where they got the expression grab and go. Because at the end of the day, there is no time to waste. So now you've seen how the legend of Ophiuchus is essentially telling us about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now let me say this. What you're looking at here, this is the church right here. Someone is saying, oh, but I thought you said it was the Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Yes, but the Holy Spirit is not the one that holds the serpent. It is the church. But the church is not able to hold the serpent in that kind of authority without the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, and you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And what did he say in Luke? He says, you will bear up the serpent in your hand and it will not hurt you. It is by the Holy Spirit that we're able to bear up the serpent. So the church becomes the Ophiuchus of legend because of the Holy Spirit, the power of resurrection. This is how God sees us. And God is saying, this is what, this is take your position right now. There is a battle formation and this is the position that God wants you to take. Because the moment you take your place in the Holy Spirit and begin to do things by godly authority, guess what happens? Not only will you take the serpent that is assigned to you, but you will take on the scorpion that is assigned to the world. The serpent represents your own personal temptations. But the scorpion represents the grip that is on the world. I mean the scorpion. And that is the reason why it has four legs here and it has four legs here. To show that it has a grip on the four corners of the earth. Now this scorpion that you're looking at, Jesus also told us something about the scorpion. He says in Mark chapter 16 verse 18 that he has given us authority over snakes and scorpions. And over all the powers of the enemy. 
And then the Holy Spirit said to me, he said to me one day, he says, do you even know what that means? And I said, uh, I have power over serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy. Let me remind you of something that I started to mention a couple of weeks ago about the power of conjunctions in the word of God. The Holy Spirit said to me that to have power over scorpions, you must have power over serpents. If you have not been able to lay hold of your own personal temptations and win, forget about having power over scorpions that is troubling your tribe. And then if you have not overcome what is troubling your tribe, forget about all the other powers of the enemy. It is a progression. It is a maturity model for exercising authority. And that is the reason why fighting your own personal temptations is very key. Forget about the fact that, look, even if you fail, the grace of God covers you. Yeah, but how long are you going to be there being pampered by grace when your brothers and sisters are still being held captive? You need to grow up quickly, overcome your own little temptations, and help them to overcome the scorpion. And by the time you're standing on the scorpion, then you can now start talking about all the powers of the enemy. Ophiuchus is already dealt with the serpent. And now he is standing on the scorpion but what is the ultimate victory to overcome all the powers of the enemy this is the power of the enemy in its totality libra and someone is like how can a pair of scales be the most dangerous thing when you look at the zodiac everything in the zodiac is an animal a living thing whose breath is in his nostrils right you look at all the signs in the zodiac from aries the goat to pisces the fish everything is a living thing but libra libra is a pair of skills how do you kill something that is not alive and that's what makes libra very dangerous and what is libra libra is the system itself scorpions are the agencies of the system but the overall system itself is Libra because Libra is what a pair of scales. Scales represent the legal system. And there is no society without a legal system. If we don't have a set of laws, we don't have a country. We did not claim that we have a country until we had a constitution. Until we said, look, this is what will guide everybody's action. And that was what defined the functions within our society, the scale. The scale, but there is no scale without bad actors, the scorpions. Let me show you, because I don't want you to think that I'm just reading this thing from Time Magazine. Come with me to Revelation chapter 6. What do we see in Revelation chapter 6 verse 5? Let's start reading from verse 3. The Bible says, when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Oh, <clears throat> let me help you a, a little bit. Revelation chapter 6. It says in verse 1. Let's start reading from verse 1 because it's so much fun. Now I saw when the land opened one of the seals. And I heard one of the living, one of the four living creatures, which I've explained that it actually literally means life-giving creatures saying with a voice like thunder come and see and i looked and i behold a white horse he who sat on it had a bow and a crown was given to him and he went out conquering and to conquer i like to call that one the corona because corona means crown when he opened the second seal i heard the second living creature saying come and see Another horse, fiery red, went out and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. I started reading from verse 1 because I wanted you to see one thing. It always says, come and see. If we don't look at the signs, we're not going to see. And if we do not see, we do not know the anatomy of the enemy that we're dealing with or the times that we're in now verse 5 which is where we're really going 
When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, come and see. Again, come and see. So I looked and I behold, so I looked and behold a black horse and he who sat on it had a pair of scales. What is the color of the most dangerous scorpions? They are black. The black horse represents that which carries the most dangerous enemy, which is the system. So first of all, you overcome your own personal temptations. And then you go on from there to dealing with the principalities and the powers. Before you can start talking about overcoming all of the powers of the enemy. But the beauty of what we are seeing here is that every one of these things is happening at the same time. At 12, 12, May 16. Why is God showing us this picture? God is letting us know that this is the time for us to bring out the authority that he has given to us and begin to overcome. Because if we don't do it now, we have wasted all of that authority as far as our own individual lives are concerned. When I saw this thing, I said to Alan, I said, do you know that, I said, and I reminded him of a conversation that we had earlier in the day, the same day before he sent me this picture. I said, literally, almost from out of nowhere, I started to speak to you about a particular way of exercising our authority in Christ. And what did I tell you? I said, sometimes we are on the defense. But God wants us to now be on the offense. Which is, you look at the things that have dealt with you in the past and insulted your call in the past. And now, you wait for them to show up. Not to do it again. But as soon as you see them from afar, you put them in their place. Where we are now is such that Pretty much every evil thing that will happen has happened. But some of them would want to happen again. But the Bible says affliction will not arise a second time. And that is the reason why I'm not waiting until the head gets close to me. If it's the tail that I can grab, I am grabbing it. I'm not waiting until the scorpion bites me. And I say, look, I'm a believer. Scorpions bite me and nothing happens. No, this time around, I'm not even going to wait until it bites me. I am stepping on it. And when I step on that which is holding the scales then guess what happened i'm no longer operating by the scale of the world i am operating by the scale of heaven let me show you the scale of the world and the reason why you do not want it you know the bible says and my god shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory by christ jesus because if you're waiting for the system to supply your needs the system is broke and broken Revelation chapter 6 verse 6. As soon as the scale was presented, what did we see? We saw exactly what we're seeing now, which is inflation that will lead to famine and scarcity. What does it say? He says, I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. A denarius is a day's wage. And do not harm the oil and the wine folks I've thought about this before and just to give you a, you know um, a quick answer because I know the question on your mind is so what is the oil what is the wine we know the wheat we know the barley it's talking about food it's talking about things in the economy the things that we buy the things that we believe that our lives depend on we're talking about the fact that they will go up so much in price that people will not be able to afford them and if you keep reading the bible says and then there was great famine upon the earth right so those things are coming but what is that thing that god is saying not to hurt because there is a reason why god is preserving that the wine represents the blood of jesus the wine represents the blood of Jesus, but more importantly, I want us to know that the wine also represents fellowship. Because when Jesus had that last supper with his disciples, they sat together, they broke bread, and they had wine. 
And that is the reason why the Bible says, as you see the day approaching, do not forsake the gathering together of yourselves because there is power in that fellowship. The first time I was in the trance concerning the last days, what did I see? I saw that when the, when the, when the believers, the saints were having fellowship, that which they had, I saw literally bottled water in someone's garage. And as soon as they took the bottled water to take it to the place of meeting, another one was replenished. It was replenished supernaturally while the world was having protest on the streets for having nothing to eat or drink. As long as the wine is kept alive, Guess what? You are not in the system of the world. What is the oil? The oil represents joy. The Bible says it will give you the oil of what? Of gladness. Now, what are the things the enemy has been attacking of late? Joy and fellowship. Fellowship has been greatly, where's my microphone? Fellowship has been greatly attacked because some people you, that you would normally fellowship with, you avoid them now and they avoid you because of the fact that the, the red horse already came with a sword into the world to cause men to fight one another. I, I would love to call that uncle of mine, but we're always, we're just going to argue. Since 2020, we've been arguing. He likes the mask, I don't like the mask. He, he likes the job, I don't like the job. We've been arguing. He likes this person and I don't like that person. So I'm not going to call him. Simply because there is a lot in the world that has separated us. Now it's not about being right or being wrong as much as the devil is about being divided. You understand what I mean? And so the enemy has attacked fellowship. I mean look at us, almost all of 2020, people didn't even want to leave their homes. You understand what I mean? Several churches were shut down. We saw somebody the other day who came to fellowship and she was like, this is the first time that I'm coming out. And I'm like, wow. I was like, man. I thought she was the last to the game until we went to an event this last Saturday and we met a couple who have yet to go back to church. Oh, yes. Well, that's what I said too. Oh, wow. My sentiment exactly. But here is the reality of it. The devil's done everything to attack fellowship. And then, of late, joy is also being attacked. Let me tell you something. Today I was teasing myself. I said, I remember there was a time that I used to sing all the time. But lately, it hasn't been as easy. Can you relate? Oh yeah, it hasn't been as easy. My wife knows people would be begging me to keep quiet. I'll be singing everywhere and dancing. You know, that's why I don't believe that practice makes perfect. Because I've been practicing how to dance for 27 years and I still can't dance. You see what I mean? I've got two left feet when it comes to that. But here is the deal. I was teasing myself. I said, look at you. Now you have to make an effort. And there was a time that it was so seamless. You understand what I mean? And I, I'm glad that I was teasing myself rather than judging myself. Because sometimes the devil wants you to seem like it's your fault that you're not as joyful as you used to be. No, no, it's not my fault that I'm not as joyful. It's because there is an attack on the oil. But the Lord says to not hurt the oil and do not hurt the wine. And so the devil cannot really hurt it, but he can give you the impression that it is being hurt. He's selling the illusion to us. During the lockdown, they said people should not meet, that churches should not meet. Any gathering more than 25 people, especially in this state, was frowned upon. But let me tell you something. Those of us who met, nobody came to tell us not to meet. The reality of it was they were not able to hurt the fellowship. It only was hurt to the extent to which people allowed it. You understand, you understand what I mean? We had fellowship. We did all of what we would normally do. We broke bread together. And guess what? Nothing happened other than the fact that we enjoyed being with one another. And now that the devil is trying to make you feel like there is not any reason for you to be joyful. Once you can see past that delusion, guess what happens? The joy will return. Because at the end of the day, what is that thing that is capable of taking your joy? I tell you what, one little secret that was revealed to me a while ago and I shared it here I think in 2018 was this. I was driving and a couple of things came to my mind and each one was weighing me down. There were things that needed to be done that weren't getting done. Things that I was getting a little agitated about. And the Lord said to me, he said, what is keeping you in this mood? 
Do you know how much Jesus paid for you to have joy? He paid with his life so that you can have joy. And so the fact that you might lose that money, does it compare to the price that he paid? I repented that very moment. Nothing is worth losing my joy over because Jesus paid such a price for it. And the moment you have that revelation, guess what? Nothing can touch your joy. So here is the deal, folks. This scale that you're looking at that is being held by the scorpion is intended to be against you. It's a rigged system against you. So, but what do you do? The moment you grab the serpent and you step on the scorpion and you bring it under subjection, they can no longer determine whether you have joy, neither can they determine whether you have peace. Simply because the Lord has brought your enemies under your feet. This is what we are expecting. So the question now is, what do we do about it? Come with me to Isaiah. Let me show you something here, Isaiah 29. So now that you know that from heaven's perspective, this is the time of utmost application of authority. Isaiah 29, Isaiah 29 verse 11. And I think we might even read verse 13 as well. Let's just get there first. Isaiah 29, verse 11. And this is what it says. It says in, 20, in verse 11 of Isaiah 29, The whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one who is literate, saying, Read this, please. And he says, I cannot, for it is sealed. Then the book is delivered to the one who is literate, saying, read this please. And he says, I am not literate. Sorry, it was delivered to one that was illiterate. And he says, I am not literate. Therefore, verse 13, the Lord said, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. Let me read that again. It says, Inasmuch as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me, and their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men, therefore, behold, I will again do a marvelous work among these people, a marvelous work. And a wonder, for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. Now, there is a lot in here, but I want to bring out three things real quick. Let's first of all go to verse 13. What does it say in verse 13? It says, if their fear toward me is taught by the commandments of men. The commandment of men. What did I tell you about the scale? The scale is the fundamental element of any society. What is the equivalent of the scale? The commandment. The Israelites did not have a society after they were plucked out of Egypt until God gave them the commandment. We're not supposed to operate based on the commandment of men, which means we're not supposed to operate based on the scales that men give. But before all of that, I want us to go back to verse 11 and verse 12. It says the whole vision has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed, which men deliver to one another to one who is literate, saying, read this, he says, I cannot because it is sealed. Many of us are literate in scripture. We have read the word of God. We have read prophecy. But we're saying these things are sealed. They still don't make any sense. But the Bible says the vision becomes to you as that which is sealed. The vision is made plain only to those who are looking at it but the ones who are trying to understand what God is saying without looking up to them even though they are literate in prophecy and scripture it will still be sealed because they are not beholding they are not looking 
You see what I mean? All of what God wants to say to you and I. When I saw this, there were specific instructions that God gave to me that was my own marching order for this season simply because I am looking at the signs and deducing that which should be given to me. And the Lord is saying, in the last days, I do not want anybody to have an excuse. So whether you are literate in scripture and in prophecy or you are not, I have made the vision plain. All you have to do is just look up. Romans chapter 1 it says from the visible elements of this world we have an understanding of the invisible attributes of God so that we are without excuse the reason why God is showing this is so that all of us may know the time that we are in let us appreciate the commandments of men and the systems that we have found ourselves in but the time has come for us to rely on the system of heaven this authority is only going to be effective by faith now let's go verse 12 verse 12 we're just going to read that again he says then the book is delivered to the one that is illiterate saying read this and he says i am not literate therefore the lord said in as much as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips but i've removed their hearts far from me let me tell you something authority that has been given to us where was it put it was put in our mouths Jesus says, now the kingdom of God is near you, even in your mouth. Many of us can speak what the word of God says. We can say, oh, whatever I bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatsoever I loose on earth is loose in heaven. But that is only half of the picture. He says, their hearts have to be in sync with me. You know the reason why? Jesus says, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth is loosed in heaven, right? And so I can just speak on earth and heaven will do what it's supposed to do. But the battle has evolved. Toward the end of Jesus' ministry, the battle evolved. And he said to his disciples, he says, I see Satan fall like lightning. While you and I were busy speaking here, heaven was taking care of Satan. But now that Satan has come to the earth, our strategy has to change. We can no longer just speak and expect things to happen because he's no longer in heaven where they can bind him on your behalf. He is now here. So what do you need? You need to sink your heart with God so that God's authority works for you here on earth. Let me quickly show you what exactly we're looking at in Scripture. Let me show you this verse of scripture from the Gospels. And then we're going to wrap up. So from the Gospels here, I think I can, I can stop showing this picture now. Um, let's go to Luke chapter um, 11 very quickly. Let's go to the book of Luke chapter 11. And we're going to look at verse 10. Um, hold on a second. Actually, I saved it here so that I do not forget. Can you see it on the screen? Oh, it's Luke chapter 10. Oh, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's Luke chapter 10, verse 19. Yeah? Luke chapter 10, verse 19 was a good thing that I saved it because I wouldn't want to miss that. Oh, yes. Now. What did I share with us a couple of weeks ago about authority? Before we even knew any one of these things was going on in the heavens. I was here and the Lord said to me to read to you all from Mark chapter 3 verse 11. Wherein it says that the demons, they recognized Jesus. And the moment Jesus was around, everybody behaved. Right? The moment he showed up, even before he said a thing, everybody just, all of those demons, they started to tremble. Now, that kind of authority is what the Lord wants us to operate in. Which is authority that is not waiting until you get to the neck, from the tail of the serpent, from afar off, from a distance. You're not waiting to be struck, you're striking. That is what the Lord started to prepare us for. And now we're coming into the fullness of that. Now in Luke chapter 10, verse 17, pretty much everything that I've said tonight and what you're looking at on the screen came together. Verse 17 says, Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even demons are subject to us in your name. 
those guys were operating in the fullness of the authority in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, I give to you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the powers of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. What we're seeing here is trampling over the things that used to be in the air. Remember, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against what spiritual wickedness in high places. They're no longer in high places. They're now on the ground. Some of them have bodies like us, and they're on TV. Some of them are on social media. Many of them are in the news. Others, you run into them at the grocery store. The picture that the Lord is painting for us now is that we need to recognize that the authority that God wants us to walk in is an authority that is in full combat mode. Because this is where it's at. But how do you fully operate in it? He says, don't just use your mouth. He says, let your heart be in sync with mine. Let your heart be what? Be in sync with mine. I know that that time is fast spent and I see some people are waning already, but I'll tell you two things about letting your heart be in sync with the Lord. You see, let me tell you one of the things that is about to happen. One of the things that is about to happen is we definitely and clearly within the next couple of months have to choose whether we will obey the Lord or we will obey the scales of men. I've been saying it for a while, but now we are just a few months away from it. On a number of issues, you would have to choose. I say, you know what? Yeah, I'm good. I'm just going to do what the Word of God says. Now, when that time comes, you're not just going to be rebellious. Because if you're just being rebellious without authority, the system will deal with you. You understand what I mean? Don't just say that, oh, if that is the requirement for going to the store, I'm not going to go to the store. You will not have what is in the store. It's not going to magically appear, but it can miraculously appear if you follow the plan that God has laid. And you know what? When that time comes, this is the way we're going to operate. Before we speak, we have to see. Let me say this again. Before we speak, we have to what? We have to see. Because, you know, there was a time wherein we speak and then we see that which we have said. Right? But now we have to see what we must say. Otherwise, we will be acting without the full cooperation of heaven. And so this is what's going to happen. If anyone comes to you and says, hey, everybody's doing this now. Are you going to join in? Don't just say no because you know that you will not join in. Wait until you have heard and seen what the Lord is saying because they would want to catch you in your words. But the moment you hear what God is saying and then you say exactly what God is saying, let me give you a more practical example because I don't want to fully say all of what I have seen because the time has not come. So let me give you an example from what has happened in the past. When the wise men came to Herod, and they told Herod what they had seen, that a king is born in Bethlehem, and they had seen a star from the east. What did Herod say to them? He was like, oh, you go and find out. And then once you have found out, come and tell me. They could have said, we will not come to tell you. And he would have arrested them and they would not have seen the king. But what did they say? They said, yeah, sure. You got it. You see what I mean? And then later on, the Bible says they were led the other way. Yes, they were led the other way. So the reason why I'm saying that, ladies and gentlemen, is that there is a particular kind of cunning craftiness which will be operational by the wisdom of God that we need to engage in Lord help me I'm going to say this because it's a seed and in a few months we will revisit this and then it will make more sense
The reason why I'm saying that is this. The word of the Lord came to me yesterday. A reminder word that we have to be as cunning as the serpent, even while we're being gentle as the lamb. It is not how you feel that determines how you speak anymore. You speak by divine wisdom. Hear what God is saying, right? Now, let me give you this, and now I'm going to close. I know that I said two things, but let's just stop at that one thing, which is for you to be of the same heart with the Lord is you need to hear what he is saying. And don't just say what you want to say. So, Alan, come here. Let me use you as an example. So, Alan comes to me and say, and say Pastor, in my place of work, they're asking everybody to sign this disclaimer. That, okay, if, if I'm not doing this, then I admit to all the consequences that come with it, right? What do we do? My natural inclination will be like, just say no, you're not signing it, right? That would be me and Alan operating just within ourselves. But what if at that particular moment the Lord says, sign it, but not your regular signature? And that puts them at bay. Now, I don't want it to seem like I'm contradicting what you know in Scripture. What has happened is this. Two years ago, it would have come to me. I would have said, no, if they're trying to force you to take this into your body, just tell them, no, you're not taking it. But now that we are operating under this authority, we're not just speaking of our own. We want to hear what God is saying first because he may be leading us another way, but also by our action of obedience, causing us to lead the enemy the other way. Just like the wise man. Jesus said to the servant who told his master's de debtors, he said, just take your pen. I know you owe my master 80 talents but just say you owe 50 write it down and jesus says blessed is that servant for he acted wisely using the things of unrighteous mammon to purchase for himself eternal friendship to purchase for yourself eternal friendship you need to know how to manipulate the system of mammon under the instruction of god you understand what i mean what we're looking at is trampling over the scorpions and the serpent. We will have to dish out a couple of things back to them in their own coins. But we're not going to do it because of our emotions, because the enemy will catch us, but we will do it because the Lord says so. So Alan, please go and sit down. Now, so what I have just read to you, or what I've just explained, should make this clear. So now let's go back to the same Isaiah chapter 29. And now let's read one of those verses. Mm -hmm. Verse 15, where did we stop? We stopped in verse 14, right? Which says, therefore behold, I will again do a marvelous work among the people and a marvelous work and a wonder for the wisdom of their wise men shall perish and the understanding of their prudent men shall be hidden. I pray that you get this. Some of us may need to go and meditate on it when we get home. What does he say? He says the wisdom that you need to operate with shall be hidden. We know what we want to do with what the system is asking us but the wisdom shall be hidden like a pearl we will we will do things that will not be as conspicuous simply because of the times that we're in it is hidden wisdom now verse 15 this one is the joy of it it says woe to those who seek deep to hide their counsel from the lord and their works are in the dark they say who sees us and who knows us. The Lord is saying, if you do not involve me, heaven will take your actions as though you're hiding from the Lord. Your heart needs to be in sync with the Lord, not just your lips. So how do you make sure that your heart is in sync with the Lord? Don't just speak to men of what you're going to do. Speak to God first of all. Have a deliberation with him. Let him know what is in your heart so that you can receive what is in your heart. And he will give you the divine wisdom to hide your next move from the system. Because this thing is about to become very real. But we're not going to be blatant. We're not going to be reckless, but what are we going to be? We will be wise in our dealings. I want you to begin to pray that the Lord would allow for you to move in the divine wisdom 
for this battle of the ages. Let me tell you something. A great change is coming to the world. A big, big change is coming to the world. And when that change comes, the world will do one thing, which is the next move. And what is that next move? They will make you choose between them and God. Remember the kingdom of Nimrod. Where, where did it start? It started with... Um, say that again. Oh yeah, no, no. When they got the plain of Shinar was the last place. In fact, let me look at it very quickly because I want to wrap up on this note. So let's go to uh, Genesis chapter ten, and I'm going to tell you exactly what he started with. He ended with the plain of Shinar, but I want to tell us the beginning. The Bible says, "And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, which means confused by mixing." Alrighty? So there's a lot of convolution in the system of the world. It's, it's convoluted by design so that you can be confused. But it's going to end where? It's going to end in the plain of Shinar. And what it means when you get to Shinar, it means you get to a place wherein there are two forks in the road and you have to choose one. But because they have guided your decisions up onto that gateway, they want you to choose mammon over God. But if you choose mammon too blatantly, they will overpower you. But there's a way that you have to choose with the hidden wisdom of God. And that is where we have gotten to. And I'm glad that y'all are looking at me like that because I know this is one of those things wherein it should motivate us to go before the Lord and say, okay, I've seen the image, the serpent, the scorpion, and the scales. I know the serpent represents my personal temptations. The scorpion represents the, the principalities and the powers. And then the scale represents the power of the enemy. The power the enemy has over me is the scale. The reason why many of us go to work and pay attention to work more than we pay attention to the things of God is because they keep showing us that the scale is tilting one way and you want to overcome it. They show that you have more bills than you have money. So you want to do more work so that you can pay those bills. And, and it's a scale. You already agreed to it. So you can't say that I'm going to use all that electricity from Georgia Power and not pay. They have the power to come and remove your access. And so we're in a battle against the scale. But in order for us to win over the serpent, the scorpion, and the scale, we need a kind of wisdom that is unconventional. And that wisdom that is unconventional is simple. Don't speak until you have heard God. Don't make a move until you have seen the hand of God. So we need to sharpen our discernment in the times that we're in. Can I recommend one thing for you to do? And I'm begging you. I'm going to do it too. I want you to read the book of Genesis. As many chapters in the day as you can. Give yourself a target. Read it. And when you get to the, the end of it, read Exodus. When you get to the end of it, come back to Genesis. And then read to Exodus again. The reason why that is important for us is that everything that we need to understand this divine wisdom of God is in those two books. Why? We have come to another Exodus. God wants to get us out of the system of the world. But we need to know how to operate because we will not know how to move in the Exodus if we don't know exactly who we are in the Genesis. I want to encourage you because let me tell you something. I say this I know it's a little controversial, but I'm going to say it anyway. We have come to a time wherein God will ask you to do things that you once heard you must not do. Okay, let me say this again. God will ask you to do things that you once heard that is unlawful for you as a person named by the name of God to do. And I'm glad that the Holy Spirit reminded me of that. I wanted to say that to you at the beginning, but I'm glad I didn't because it wouldn't have made as much sense. Remember, we started today's message from where? From Matthew chapter 29, verse 11. What Jesus was doing was once unlawful on the Sabbath to do any work. But because the strategy at the time had changed, he did that which is unlawful. The disciples did, but he endorsed it. And so this time around, there are certain unlawful things that you would have to do, but you will be doing it knowing fully well that you have heard from God. That is the key. You have heard from God. Now, I'm going to wrap up with that picture, and, and that will be it. So, Alan, can you let me have access to that screen again? It's mine now. Because... 
Um, please come on Tuesday next week. I want to make sure that we get this thing. So watch the screen one more time. And then we're going to close this thing off. Um, it's not letting me, Alan. What am I doing wrong? Okay, sorry, it's me. I was, yeah, I was clicking the, um, the wrong selection here. Okay, so I'm taking my time and picking my words because I don't want to sound like I'm teaching blasphemy. But there's a reason. When you were growing up, what did you learn about the serpent? You never grab it by the tail. Because it will bite. But the fiocus is grabbing it where Jesus says to grab it. Where the Lord says to grab it. It is unlawful. It is unconventional. It is not according to the commandments of men. But it's God's way of getting it done in these last days. In the times that we have come to. Don't even think about it in the perspective of last days. Just think about it in the fact that we are coming to a season wherein we will be asked by God to do unconventional things to access the wisdom of God. When you were growing up as a child, me more than most people in this room, I, when I was a child, I got beat by scorpions multiple times multiple times and I didn't know why until last week or so two weeks ago my mom and I and my brothers we were talking and my sister was there too we were having a family meeting and they just brought it up they were like we just remember how many times you were beat by scorpions when you were growing up I said yeah now I know and they're like what do you mean I said because some of the things that I know now and the way that I think helps me by God to understand the scorpions of our time because I know what that sting feels like and one of those times that I was bitten by a big black scorpion, I was about the age of six years old, the venom of that scorpion was such that it made me hallucinate within minutes. I started to hallucinate. I was having hallucinations. I ended up in the hospital for days. But let me tell you something. What does that black scorpion do? And why does it make you hallucinate? It gives you a reality that is not the reality. It puts you, it creates a virtual reality around you and they expect you to function by it. And so within that virtual reality, that which is lawful is lawless. And that which is lawless is lawful if it is by God. Because for you to act right within the wrong system, you may have to act wrong. I'm saying these things because this is unlawful. This is not what you are told. You don't put your foot on a scorpion right where... It allows for its tail to remain free because it's going to sting you. And so here is the deal, folks. There is no way you will know what is righteous and what is safe to do if you don't hear it directly from God. This, bless you. Wow, that is awesome. I think my leader has already heard from God. So, folks, how do you prepare? Everything that I have told you, Getting your heart to be in sync with the Lord. We're going to break bread now because of time. I know my wife's been giving me the look. But I'm going to quickly say one more thing as we're breaking bread. So that we can have another assignment in addition to Genesis and Exodus. For us to focus on that we may be thoroughly furnished unto every good works. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 7. The book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse 7, it says, Then I return and saw vanity under the sun. There is one alone without companion. He has neither son nor brother. Yet there is no end to all his labors, nor is his eyes satisfied with riches. But now listen, but the Bible says, but he never asks. For whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This is all vanity. And also a grave misfortune. The Bible says he never asks. The reality of what we're about to experience is this, folks. I'm trying to explain it and I think this might actually be the simplest approach to take. Which is, how do I know the mind of God? How do I know what's the heart of God? How do I come in sync with him? Just ask. Study Genesis and Exodus. This is not an excuse, a way to get away from doing the assignment. But the Bible says, just ask. Ask, let him speak. When you speak, then you speak. If you speak of your own accord in the time that we're moving into, 
you be grabbing the scorpion by the tail, the serpent by the head, which is what everybody is doing, but it will not bring out the fullness of the wisdom of God and the authority of heaven. So let's wrap it up on that note today. But I'm thinking of a thousand and one other things that I want to share with you. Come Tuesday next week. We're going to revisit that image. And then I'm going to show you exactly how in the life of Jesus and in the ministry of Jesus, he came to a time wherein there was this formation in the heaven as he was going to the cross. And by the time we look at it from the life of Jesus, I think it's going to make more sense to us. But if you're going to take anything out of here today, I want you to take away these three things. This is the reality that we're about to step into. The reality calls for unconventional way of doing things. The reality calls for the full exercise of your authority. No longer you are no longer are you to exercise authority only by speaking. Your heart has to be in sync with God. And what is the reason why? Because the enemy that is meant to be bound above has already fallen to the ground. And so the strategy has to evolve. If you can take those three things and you start to operate on them or meditate on them, let me tell you what's going to happen. Your, kind, your, your way of thinking is going to shift. And one day I'm going to explain to you exactly the reason why I've been smiling so much as I'm getting to the end of this message. Simply because... Anyway, let me not try to explain it. I said one day, but not now. Let us rise up today and quote this scripture and affirm this scripture together. The same Ecclesiastes chapter 4 that we have just read. The Bible says in verse 9, two are better than one. So I want you to say, Father, I am better when you are with me. I am better when I am with you. I will not speak of my own accord. I will not say what men say. say. But I will say that which you say. I will not do it by my emotions. I will not do it by the consensus of opinion. But I will do it by your Holy Spirit. I will not do it by the way I feel feel. or what is expected by the system system. because that is flesh and blood. blood. But I will do it it. because I will hear you you. and I will see what you're showing me and And then I will be be in in full authority to bear the serpent in my hands. And to step upon the scorpion. scorpion. In Jesus name. name. Before we break bread today. I want to pray for somebody. As I was praying. I see that you keep looking over your shoulder. To see if others are with you. Like man this thing that I want to do. This way that I want to live my life. What God is calling me to do. Are they with me? You keep checking over your shoulder. The Lord says to you. To mind your business. To do that which I have commanded you to do. Because they may not receive the wisdom that God is offering to you. God is offering it to them as well. But they may not receive it. So you cannot move on with the Lord waiting for their approval. They will not approve of what the, of what things the Lord is asking you to do. But just keep doing it. Keep doing it. Because now it is not the multitude. It is not the consensus of opinion. But it is what the Holy Spirit says to you. It is from here on you and the Holy Spirit. It is because of you that the Holy Spirit was given. So that you can hold up the serpent. So that you can tread upon the scorpion. But more importantly so that you can be raised to life and peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want you to say that money is a defense. defense. Wisdom is a defense. Wisdom is a defense. I receive the wisdom of God so that I don't have to depend on the money. In the mighty name of Jesus. So let's do this very quickly. Our time is already fast spent. I want to rebuke seven fears over us. Because as I was speaking, particularly in the last 20 minutes, which is kind of like the extra time that I took, I noticed that there was a lot of puzzled faces 
And I'm like, God, this thing is simple. Why are faces puzzled? I kept pinging the Holy Spirit. And it says to me that each and every one of us, because deep calls to deep, our spirit already understands and knows what God is saying. However, there are fears that are holding us back because this is not what we're used to. What God is calling us to do and how he's calling us to operate in these last days is not what we're used to. And so certain fears are beginning to well up within us. The fear of rejection. The fear of being misunderstood. The fear of acting alone. The fear of, of saying maybe what if I thought I heard God but I didn't hear God. The fear of uncertainty. And the Lord is saying to call out those fears. To rebuke them and to cast them out. So that the men and the women, the men and the women of God in this room, and those that will hear this message afterwards, will not respond by fear but by confidence in God to go ahead and begin to operate by this divine strategy that God Himself calls a hidden wisdom according to His Word. And so I rebuke over every single one of us here that spirit of fear. I rebuke fear, the fear of being unsure of what God is saying. You will hear the voice of the good shepherd and you will be sure because you know his voice. Now I rebuke over you the fear of the judgment of men. Because they have not called you, God called you. And you are answerable to God and not to them. And I also rebuke over you the fear of your emotions. The fear of being led astray by your own emotions. I rebuke that over you because you are a son of God and you are led by the Holy Spirit. I rebuke over you the fear of Herod. That one we need to say together. Lord, I resist the fear of Herod. Because Herod represents the, the kings. It represents the authority of the day. That fear of what they may do. That fear of what they may say. You resist that fear. Not just rebuke it, but resist that fear in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, the, the fifth one, I want you to look at me. Because I want to demonstrate this. And this is what I want you to picture in your mind. Like someone is walking a tight rope and they're losing their balance. I want to rebuke over you the fear of losing your balance. You see, the Bible says narrow is the path that leads to righteousness. The moment you begin to operate in this new strategy, it might seem like you're walking a tight rope. But in reality, you are not. Because, let me say this for a moment, it might seem like some options are no longer available to you because God has called you to walk the line. But in reality, the one who's calling you to walk the line has also given you the confidence to do it successfully. You see, I give the example of the grocery store. If the Lord is saying to you, don't go to that particular place. The, way, the place that he leads you, there will be enough options, enough variety, and the abundance that you need. So that fear of being limited in the things that God is asking you to do, I break it over you in the mighty name of Jesus. So while the enemy is making you feel like you will not have a place to put your feet and you may stumble, just know that where you're standing is the rock of ages. And you can walk and move because you live, you move, and you have your being on the inside of him. Now the fear number six is the fear of being alone. Many people around you will continue to follow the crowd. But I pray that in the mighty name of Jesus, that you will begin to have an appreciation for the presence of God. A recognition of the presence of God. Even if you are the only one at your work, in your neighborhood, at your church, in your family, that is doing what God is saying to do, you will not be afraid of being alone because you will know that the Lord is with you. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the very last of those seven fears is the fear of not having done enough. The fear of what? Of not having done enough. Because quite often there are certain things that we have been told that you have to do in order to get certain things. But the Lord is telling you to do the one thing that is needful. In these last days, the wisdom of God is telling you to do that which is needful. Now, when I said last days the other time, the Holy Spirit said to me, just say in this season. You know why? Because it's a very short season and afterwards everything will look different again. 
so that you do not carry this over you need to use all of it in this next season so in this next season folks i pray for you that in the mighty name of jesus you will not have the fear of not having done enough the enemy will not use the fear of that feeling of insufficiency to push you to turn stone into bread you will be content with the word of god you'll be content with obeying what the lord has said and whatever wants to make you to do more than what god is saying will not succeed over you in the mighty name of Jesus. Now, let me just say this, and I want everybody to tap into this prophetic word. I know that our time is fast spent today, but in reality, we're not even spending enough time. And I'll tell you the reason why we're not spending enough time. There's a lot of work that needs to be done on us, but we're, not rest, we're too restless. We're not resting enough for God to do his work. So whenever the Holy Spirit gets us together in this room, he gets to put a lot of things into the work. You see, Everybody look at Laura. And the reason why I'm asking everybody to pay attention to this word is because I know that what I'm about to say over you applies to some other people in here, but there's a reason why God wants to use you as that example. There are certain people that God is revealing to me who are already plotting what they will do to you in this next season. I see them having conversations that we know that Laura is going to want to do this but we will stop her. We will tell her this. We will not let her do that. Let me tell you something. Any counsel that is against you as his righteous will not hold. Now that is the word of God. And someone is like, well, since the word of God already says they will gather, but because the gathering is not of the Lord, it will not stand. Why do I even need to worry? Why do I need to pray? The reason why you need to be concerned and the reason why you need to, be, to pray and be prayerful is this. You have antennas that pick up what people are plotting. Even though the Lord will confuse their devices, your emotions sometimes get charged because of the fact that evil is being plotted against you. David said this, he said, I was not in the room. He said, but their slander was like tasty trifles in my blood. He said, I was not in the room where they were plotting against me. He said, but their slander was like somebody shot an arrow that was poisoned and I could feel it in my veins. So this is the reason why we need to pray so that we are not becoming anxious, neither are we getting aggressive when we meet with these people that Satan is using. And so I'm glad that you're being raised as an example. But what the Lord is showing to me is that no matter what they're plotting, you will rise against whatever they're plotting. Amen. Let me tell you something. Some of these people, we know them to be friends. But because they're not in submission to God in these last days, they've been recruited to the army of Satan. We will not walk into their traps. And even when we walk where they have set traps, the Lord will deliver us from their sneer. Our emotions will not be controlled by them. Our waking moments will not be controlled by them. And certainly when we sleep, they will not be able to take away our peace. In the mighty name of Jesus. Those seven fears have been rebuked. We're going to break bread and I'm going to say one more prayer. Because we need to leave here. And I want us to leave here with that equipment. So take your cup and take the bread and the wine and then we're going to say just one more prayer afterwards so for now let's be seated we'll sit and then we're going to pray and then we're going to close father in the mighty name of jesus we thank you for the body of the lord jesus that was broken for us as we eat of it lord today we do so in remembrance of his sacrifice and as we drink of the wine also we remember that he has given us his life so that we can be confident that as he was so are we as he was able to overcome the principalities and powers we also will overcome in the mighty name of Jesus Jesus operated already in this the serpent he overcame the scorpion he overcame and he gave us the victory over all the powers of the enemy and we will do the same so Lord Jesus will call to your remembrance your victory to be our hope and to be our joy in this season in Jesus name you may eat and you may drink Praise the Lord. So this is the very last thing today. And um, I know this will tie us over to the next meeting. Or till you find yourself resting in the presence of the Lord. Proverbs chapter 8. Proverbs chapter 8. I'm going to quickly read verse 11. And come back to verse 3 very quickly. Romans, Romans chapter 8 verse 11 it says for wisdom is better than rubies 
and all the things one may desire cannot compare to her. Verse 3 says, She cries out by the gates, at the entry of the city, at the entrance of the doors. Folks, you would have to listen to this message again. It's one of those messages, right? What did I tell you at the beginning about wisdom and understanding? Wisdom and understanding help you to overcome the advances of the seductress. They help you to shut your ears to the loud noise of rebellious thoughts. And those things that, what? Want your attention. But what have we read here just now? That wisdom is also trying to get your attention. So this one thing that I want to pray over us before we leave today. And I want you to understand it so that you can continue to pray it and meditate on it. The wisdom of God is crying out. So how come the seductress or the seduction of the serpent, the slithering tongue of the serpent and the hissing of the snake is what is busy getting me hypnotized all the time and I'm always falling for the temptation of the enemy and I feel weak and tired against the oppression of Satan. So how come I'm not hearing as loudly the voice of wisdom because the Bible says wisdom is crying out in the gates. Because I do not desire it enough. The Bible says you have to desire it above all else. The way God writes sometimes is that he poses the question or the challenge and then reveals the answer later. In verse 3, we see the challenges. You need to hear wisdom. Alan, if wisdom is crying out at the gates, in the gates, crying out, so how come I'm hearing more the temptation and the confusion of the enemy? Why am I not hearing wisdom? The Lord says, because there are things that I desire more than wisdom. And that is the reason why I cannot pick out her voice. So what is the prayer point in all of these things? That our hearts will begin to see the beauty of the wisdom of God and begin to desire her as a man desires his bride. Because if you don't desire her with utmost desire, you will not recognize her voice. Now, I haven't said that. I know it's already past 10. We have to close. But there is a thought that came to my mind. And, and this came to my mind. And I can say like Paul, it might, not, it might just be I, not the Lord. But this thought came to my mind. And for us to be able to desire wisdom as we should, we need to make recollection of the times that we have acted without the wisdom of God and gotten our fingers burnt. Some of you have to remember that person that you dated that didn't work out. And remember that you heard this voice that was telling you not to do it. That would allow for you to begin to develop a fresh desire for the wisdom of God. Because now desire comes from where? It comes from appreciation. So if I appreciate that that wisdom of God was speaking and I didn't hear it. Three things are going on when you think like that. Number one thing is what? Realization. Now I realize that that must have been the voice of the wisdom of God. But now what's the second thing? I'm repenting from not having listened to the wisdom of God. And now in order for me to redeem my future decisions, what do I do? I will now desire to have that wisdom of God with me always. So the next time he speaks, I am doing exactly what she says. The next time she speaks, I'm doing what she says. Does it make sense now? And so I say that because of the fact that when the Lord said to me, tell them about desire and pray for them, I, I, I sense that something was still missing. Practice that as an exercise. Just go over maybe four or five things in your past that did not work because you didn't pay attention to that wisdom. And the moment you look at those things, you tell yourself, the Lord said to me not to move to that place, I moved. That was the wisdom of God and I'm sorry. But now I want to hear that voice again and begin to desire that wisdom. Because when you have that wisdom, the Bible says wisdom leads you to profit. We've lost enough. Alrighty, alrighty. So let's stand up and let us pray. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, I want you to hold the person next to you on either side. Anna, join them. Let's hold somebody next to us. Hold the person next to you on either side. The way you feel their hands. Huh. Tonight, I want to bring out the oil again. But I will 
The Bible says the spirit of prophets are subject to prophets. I will be mindful of your time and mine and not do it. But I want, I will tell you the reason why I want to bring out the oil. So that you can press into it on your own without the oil. You see, the Bible says that we do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. But basically, the fact that we're so conscious of things that we feel and touch, God can use that to help us activate the faith that is in our hearts. And so as you're holding the hand of the person next to you, your left side and your right side, make sure that you're holding somebody with both hands. All right, Alan, connect. Let that hand connect somehow. Yeah, you can do that. Connect that with somebody else. I pray for you that now in the mighty name of Jesus, the way that person's hand is real in your own hand, the wisdom and understanding that you need will become real in your heart. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let us receive divine awareness of your wisdom and your understanding so that we are holding wisdom on one hand and understanding on the other hand. Lord, as real as these touches feel, let us begin to live and move in the reality of your wisdom and your understanding so that we do not stumble, so that we do not go astray in the mighty name of Jesus. And I pray for this once today, Lord, as they have honored your Holy Spirit by being attentive to the words that have come forth, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus, they will stand out amongst the rest in the coming days they will stand out among the rest in the mighty name of Jesus amen amen praise the Lord hallelujah 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 praise the Lord God is good yes father we give you praise we're not going to take up the offering today but I want you to just go home and, and, and give an offering to God as you were led but we're not going to take it up in here but on your own as you were led give an offering to God an offering of thanks an offering of appreciation give an offering to God but I want to say this before we all walk out of this place Natalie I really appreciate the fact that you stayed this long uh, you're the first person to get here today I think you were here maybe just some minutes past six but you're still here till this very time but every single one of us that is present in here, as I was saying that last prayer, I had a conversation with the Holy Spirit and I asked for one thing on your behalf. And I said, Lord, let them stand out. And he said to me, he said, say it and it shall be so. You see, the sacrifice of today will pay off. In the coming season, every single one of us in this room will stand out. And I'm telling you, the way we're going to stand out is healing a healing revival is coming to communion house and it will happen in your hands by your hands it's going to be by the lord of course but you will lay your hands on the sick and they will recover Amen. you will prophesy and you will speak the mind of god and i pray for you every single one here every single person here today that because you came today and you endured this surgery that the lord has done you will go up from here with the gift of the interpretation of dreams you see what you have is what you give Paul, Peter and John said silver and gold I do not have but what I have I give that is something that I have and I am given to you the ability to interpret dreams in the mighty name of Jesus you see I knew it and I still have to break out the oil today so Alan please give me the oil if we have stayed this long we might as well stay for five more minutes praise the Lord